morning, everyone. Please keep your Bibles open to that passage, Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verses 1 to 11. Do you think that you're greater than King David? What about uh, Elijah, the prophet? Do you think you're greater than him? Or Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or Ezekiel? I dare say none of us woke up today, looked in the mirror, and said, I am greater than Elijah. I'm greater than Isaiah. And yet, Jesus says, verse 11 of our text, that John the Baptist was greater than all the Old Testament prophets, all the people who came before him. And the one who is least in the kingdom is even greater than John. And so if the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than John, and John is greater than all the Old Testament prophets, then the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than all the Old Testament prophets. What does that mean? Well, that's what this sermon, in part, is about, finding out exactly what Jesus meant by that. Whatever point Jesus is making, he's not making a joke. He's, he, he begins verse 11 with his solemn amen. Truly, I say to you, I'm telling you the truth. Amen, I say to you. Well, we're going to read this text in four sections, the text that Greg read, and then we're going to make four points of application as we move through it together. So let's read verses 2 and 3 together. John's question begins with a question. Verse 2 and 3. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, if you have been reading the Gospel of Matthew, you come to this text, you'll probably remember that John was in prison way back in chapter 4 and verse 12 for criticizing the local king, Herod, for sleeping with a woman that wasn't his wife. It was his brother Philip's wife. And while he is in prison, he had access to news, what was going on in Galilee around him via his disciples. They would come to him and visit him, and they would tell him what Jesus was doing. Well, what kind of news would they have brought John? Well, this is taking place in chapter 11. John has been in prison since chapter 12. So what happened in Matthew chapter 5 to 10? Well, no doubt John would have heard about Jesus gathering disciples and going to the top of a mountain and sitting down and preaching them as, uh, to them as a rabbi. He would have heard about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. No doubt his disciples would have reported to him that Jesus came down from the mountain in Matthew chapter 8 and 9 and performed miracles. And he probably would have heard about chapter 10 when Jesus mobilizes his task force. He sends his disciples out into the communities to spread this kingdom message. But what we're reading here, John's still in prison and he's somewhat disappointed in the news about Jesus. All that stuff was really great, was really impressive, but somehow it wasn't the proof that he was looking for. And so he's entertaining doubts about whether Jesus is the one to come. Is he really the Christ? Should we wait? Is there someone else? Which is really ironic because remember it was John who announced the arrival of Jesus. In chapter 3, it was John who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, who heard the voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So here he is asking this question. So we have to ask why. Why is John asking this question? Did, did prison get the better of him? Is he losing his faith? Remember, John has been in prison since chapter 4. How long has that been between chapter 4 and chapter 11 here? We really don't know. But he's been languishing in prison for some time. And from his perspective, there's a, a discrepancy between what he predicted about the Christ and what he heard Jesus was doing. Well, what did John predict about the Christ? Well, back in chapter 3, in verse 11, he said this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit 
and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So what prediction did John make about the Christ? That, that Jesus was the Christ who would separate the faithful from the unfaithful. That he would bring blessing to the repentant, and he would bring judgment to those who rejected the gospel. John heard about the blessing in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the merciful. He heard about the blessing in the sermon. He, he saw the, the, the blessing enacted with the miracles of Matthew chapter 8 and 9. He heard about the growth and the spread of the blessing of the kingdom in chapter 10. What's missing, though? Where's the fire? If the Christ is to come and bring both blessing and judgment, I see the blessing, where's the judgment? In other words, Jesus, if you're the Christ, what am I doing in prison? Why is Herod going about just doing whatever he wants and throwing righteous people in prison? For someone who served God with such faithfulness and devotion, John must have at least felt forgotten or confused. From his limited perspective, it's easy to see why. Let's put the pause button on the text and bring this home to us. Are we any different? When injustice reigns in our world or in our lives and righteousness, instead of being rewarded, is punished, when we get kicked for doing the right thing, don't we, if we're honest, at times start to call our convictions into question? We know what the Bible says. We know what, how important it is to, to live as a Christian, to, to follow our king. We know what is true because it's right there in the text. But spiritual truths have a way of looking contradictory to physical realities, to what's going on down here on earth. But blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Blessed is the person who doesn't turn their back on Jesus when things don't seem to be going their way. It's not wrong to be confused. It's not wrong to have questions. John is confused. John has questions. That part's okay. The danger is to blame God in our frustrations. The danger is to assume a, a victim mentality in our suffering and to turn our backs on God. John's doing nothing wrong here. He's confused. And he's doing what all faithful Jews in the Psalms did. He brings his frustrations and his confusions to God in prayer. And he's answered in the next couple of verses. And so we can do the same thing. When we're suffering, when things look confusing down here on earth, we're to do what John did, bring those frustrations to the Lord in prayer. And we too will be answered, we'll be guaranteed to, to be heard, and we'll have our answer. So John's question, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Jesus' answer is essentially verses four to six. Hey, you want your answer? Look at what I'm doing, look at the evidence. Look at verses four to six. And Jesus answered them, remember these are John's disciples who are relaying back and forth between prison and Jesus. Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Notice Jesus does not scold John for his question. He answers him, but he doesn't answer him directly, which is kind of frustrating with Jesus, right? He, he never says, he never gives a yes, no answer, hardly ever, because he's trying to get us to think, isn't he? He's trying to get John to think. He responds by, in verse 5, alluding to the prophet Isaiah to summarize his ministry. All of those things that you see happening here, the lame walking, the deaf here, the dead are raised, that's all language from the prophet Isaiah. And so what he's doing here is he's telling John, match my deeds with the prophetic profile of the Messiah in Isaiah, and you've got your answer. 
It's a strong, affirmative answer. Yes, I am the one who is to come. You don't have to wait for anyone else. This is me. I'm here. But I think there's something deeper that Jesus is doing here. John knew the book of Isaiah really, really well. How do we know that? Well, all faithful Jews read their Bibles, right? But even more than that, John was in the book of Isaiah. <laughs> Look at chapter 3. Keep your uh, marker there in chapter 11. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, we're introduced to John the Baptist in the Gospel of Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. And then Matthew tells us this in verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John was in the book of Isaiah. If you were in a book of prophecy, I dare say that would be your favorite book. You would know that like the back of your hand. So John says, are you the one who is to come or shall we wait for another? And Jesus says, go back to Isaiah. The dead are raised, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk, the poor have good news preached to them. Do you think John would have known those passages? Do you think he would have recalled them in prison? Do you think he would have recalled the context of those passages? Those passages that Jesus was alluding to, they all are about the Messiah and about the blessings of the Messiah. But within each of those passages, I'll give you a couple of examples. There's something else. Let's see if you can see it. Here's the first one, Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, scrolling down there to the bottom. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. The blessings of the Messiah. But what does he say before that, just before it? Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. You've got the blessing, but you've got the judgment too, right? Uh, the other one, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Another messianic passage of blessing and judgment. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The poor have good news preached to them. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and, John would have liked this line, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the great jubilee, what else? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Put yourself in John's place in prison as a Jew acquainted with the book of Isaiah. He receives this answer from Jesus. Go back and tell John that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. That's Isaiah language. And if the days of messianic blessing are already here, then the day of messianic judgment must not be far behind. It's as if Jesus is telling him by alluding to those scriptures, John, the fire is coming. Be patient. Stay faithful. Trust me. Hang in there. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. What can we say to our situation from these verses? Blessed is the man who doesn't abandon Jesus when Jesus doesn't meet their expectations. Blessed is the man who doesn't abandon Jesus when Jesus says, yes, I heard your prayer, but wait a while. Blessed is the person who doesn't abandon Jesus when Jesus says, no, I've got something better in store for you. Jesus often does not meet our expectations. He will always exceed them. Jesus' answer to John's struggles is essentially the answer that he gives to all people who struggle with the problem of suffering and evil. Jesus is the Messiah who brings both blessing and judgment, but he brings them in his own way and in his own time, and ours is simply to trust him in that. 
And just like John, whenever we run into difficulty, we need to be reminded of the evidence. That's what Jesus is doing. Here's the evidence. And so whenever we have problems in our lives and struggles we're going through, and we're praying through those things, we need to remember the evidence. In the resurrection, Jesus has given us sufficient evidence that he will set the world right. Yes, we enjoy blessings now, but judgment is coming. He will set things right. As Paul told the Athenians, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. How do we know this to be sure, Paul? Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Our confidence is not some pie-in-the-sky thing. It's not some philosophy. Our confidence is rooted in something that actually happened in history, a historical fact of a human being who died, who was buried in a tomb for three days, and who came back to life never to die again. And so, therefore, we have abundant reason to trust Jesus, to serve Jesus in confident hope through whatever problems we face in this life. Just in the previous chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, you will be hated for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So don't fear them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Keep serving, keep trusting, keep doing the right thing. Judgment will come. The world will be set right. So Jesus' answer is to look at the evidence. Let's look at verses 7 to 11 here. Jesus' tribute about the greatness of John. Now, if you look at verse um, 7, it says that there was a great crowd gathered there. And they had heard this exchange between the disciples of John and Jesus' answer. So this whole crowd heard this exchange. And so lest anyone get the wrong impression about John and begin to doubt John, it's almost as if Jesus here is setting the record straight about him. He comes to his defense, and he gives him this glowing tribute. Just because John asked this question doesn't mean that prison got the better of him. doesn't mean that John's gone soft. Look at what he says in verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus asked that same rhetorical question three times. What did you go out in that wilderness to see? These are the same people who came to John to repent, to believe that the kingdom was at hand, and to be baptized in the Jordan River, a baptism of repentance, to make them ready for Jesus. Well, what, did you, what was that guy? Was he some reed shaken by the wind? Was he some fickle, vacillating politician in Jerusalem? Was he dressed in soft clothing like an effeminate royal courtier? No, that's not what you saw when you went out in the wilderness. He was a paragon of virtue, of courage, of integrity. He was a bold voice that called kings and slaves alike to repent because the kingdom was at hand. John announced the kingdom while he was living in a wasteland, wearing clothes made out of camel's hair and eating bugs for dinner. He's not a wimp. So show him some respect. He was a prophet of God who had an important message. And no one has a right to stand in judgment of him. He's being persecuted for righteousness sake. Hmm, kind of like all the Old Testament prophets before him. And like all true disciples of Jesus will be after him. Therefore, he should be honored as a prophet. You remember the Beatitudes in our Wednesday night class? The last one, blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, he says, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. John is simply being treated as a true prophet. 
Therefore, he should be honored as a prophet. But you know, John was even more than a prophet, verse 9. Because, verse 10, he was the subject of prophecy. John was a prophesied prophet. Verse 10 is straight from Malachi 3 in chapter 1, or ch chapter 3 in verse 1. But whereas the Old Testament prophets before John only foresaw Jesus, could only prophetically point to Jesus, John literally saw Jesus. John literally pointed to Jesus. Uh, on one occasion, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Therefore, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And what made John the greatest prophet up to that point was not his character, was not his achievements, was not that he was more faithful than Elijah or he could do better miracles or whatever. What made him great was simply his position in history. John stood at the fulcrum between two eras where Old Testament prediction gave way to New Testament fulfillment. So John is greater than all those prophets who came before him because he announced the arrival of the person that these people only foresaw. And so what is Jesus doing in verses 7 to 11? He's encouraging John. He's coming to his defense. He's advocating for a faithful person. That's what he's doing. So what's the application that we can make? John or Jesus is doing for John on earth before men what he promises to do for all the faithful before God in heaven. Jesus will advocate for us if we're faithful, if we confess Jesus on earth. It's, it's like what Jesus said in the previous chapter, again, offering encouragement and motivation to stay faithful. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Do you realize that that's true? It doesn't matter what anybody at your job says about you. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about you in your neighborhood. When you talk about following Jesus and being a Christian, you bring the name of Christ up in conversation. It doesn't matter what anyone says against you. Jesus is in heaven defending you. Jesus is your advocate to the Father so that you do not fall into judgment, but you approach God as a son or a daughter in faith. To confess Jesus, to acknowledge him, it means to make an open declaration of, a, of our allegiance to him, to show our public solidarity with him. It means being counted with Jesus even when it costs us to do so. And if we stand with Jesus on earth before men, despite the accusations of the enemy, despite any kind of persecution that we might endure, Jesus will advocate for us in heaven. However, if we deny him, then he will reject us at the judgment. So there's no middle ground here. As he'll say in, this, in chapter 12, the very next chapter, you're either with him or you're against him. So great encouragement here and motivation to be faithful to Jesus and to confess him. So let's get to the main point of the sermon there in verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, as great as John the Baptist was. If you are part of this kingdom, even the least in this kingdom, then you're greater than John. What is the measure of greatness? Well, greatness, according to Jesus, is not measured by the world standards. It's not about status. It's not about wealth or popularity or beauty or education or whatever. Nor is it measured in terms of, of, of character and achievements and how, how strong you are and all the kind of things that you've done for Jesus. No, we can't claim to be superior to John in these ways any more than John could claim to be superior to Elijah or Isaiah in any of these ways. Rather, the phrase greater than simply contrasts John's mission, John's dispensation, John's message with ours. You see, John belonged to an old order. He was the last of his kind. It was like a changing of the guard with John. Look at verse 13. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. He was the last. And remember in chapter 3, he came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? 
at hand, near, close by. So John announced the coming of the kingdom. We announce that the kingdom is already here. What we say to people is the king is reigning. Enter in. You are invited. The work is done. John pointed to a Jesus yet to be glorified, yet to be resurrected. We point to a Jesus who's already gone to the cross, who's already finished the work, who's already been resurrected, who's already been glorified, and who's already ascended to the right hand of the Father. John belonged to an old order of things, an old world in which death reigned. We don't belong to that world anymore. We belong to a completely different world, a new world, in which death is not what it used to be, in which our hope of life is made real and substantive in the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. John died in chapter 14. He never saw that world. He never lived in that world. We live in this world. It's a new world. It might look the same on the outside, but we know that that's different. And so we're greater than John. In the same way, a bride is greater than the best man at a wedding. In John 3, 29, John describes himself as the friend of the bridegroom. And throughout the New Testament, the church, God's people, are described as the bride of Christ. Anyone who's been to a wedding knows who receives more honor and attention. It's the bride, for goodness sakes. You don't stand up when the best man comes in the room. And so our greatness has nothing to do with our character and our, all, of our, all of our achievements for God. It's the message that we're privileged to carry to others. We get to point to a Jesus who has already defeated death, who is already reigning at the right hand of God with all authority in heaven and on earth. And even the least in the kingdom, even if you were baptized last week, it doesn't matter. You might not know the Bible like other people, but you know about God's love and his mercy that he showed you on the cross of his son Christ. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, you know about that living hope, don't you? And so when someone asks you for the hope that is within you, you simply point to Jesus whose work is done, who's already reigning. And that's what makes you great. Because you live on this side of the cross and you believe and you follow a resurrected Jesus. You point others to the greatest one of all. You point others to a Jesus that John never could. And so the obvious question is, if it is the greatest privilege of the Christian to point others to our resurrected Savior, are you doing that? This is a soul-searching question for everyone here, me included. Don't think I've got this figured out, preaching to myself here. When was the last time that you ever pointed anyone to Jesus? Was it a month ago? Was it a year ago? Too many of us go week after week, month after month, year after year, without expending any forethought, any prayer, any energy to introduce others to Jesus. We're not saying that the one who evangelizes the most is the greatest. The one who gets the most Bible studies is the greatest. The one who baptizes the most people is the greatest. That's not at all what we're saying. It's not a comparison between other Christians. It's a comparison between those who live on either side of the death and resurrection of Christ. This is what makes us significant. The fact that we point to a Jesus whose work is done. And the great tragedy is, if we fail in this, then we are failing to do the very thing that Jesus says gives us our significance. It's like what Peter is saying. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God made you into a special people so that you can do, go do something for him. He empowered you with his love and his grace 
and his spirit to go and preach, to go and share the message. We're called to be all kinds of things in the kingdom, and they're all important. We're called to be good neighbors. We're called to be upstanding citizens, faithful sons and daughters, patient moms and dads, uh, hardworking employees and, and, and fair and, and just employers. But none of those things, as important as they are, establish us, us, establishes us as greater than John the Baptist. None of those things are our primary calling. Our calling, our purpose, our discipline is to teach other people about our Lord. That's the criteria for greatness, pointing others to Jesus. This is what we are commissioned to do. Jesus told his apostles to go out and, 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 and preach, make disciples of all nations and baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then he ends with that wonderful promise, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You're not doing this alone. And we see throughout the book of Acts that that's what not just the apostles, that's what everyday Christians went out and did. They pointed, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about him. Announcing the gospel is just part of the dynamic of being a Christian. It's what we were born again to do. And we do it not only out of a sense of duty and loyalty. We do it out of a sense of love, out of a sense of mercy towards our fellow man, out of a sense of gratitude for what we have. It's a privilege. It's a love thing. A Christian who doesn't tell others the good news is as unthinkable to Jesus as a light you can't see or as salt that you can't taste. I'll share with you this poem. Shall flowers hide their beauty? Shall rainbows turn to gray? Shall birds forget their singing? Shall sunlight fade away? Shall I be silent? at grace beyond degree. Before the cross, I count as loss what once was dear to me. Are you among the least in the kingdom? If so, then it is your great privilege to announce the resurrected and victorious King Jesus. And don't be ashamed, let me encourage you, don't be ashamed to own your Lord, don't be ashamed to be confident about Jesus reigning don't lose that, that confidence in the power of the gospel. It changed your life, and it can change other people's lives as well. People need to hear that truth, and you are the person to tell them. The fact that you responded to the gospel in faith is what qualifies you to go and tell others about this faith. The promise is there. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him? of whom they've never heard. How are they to hear without someone preaching? That's your job, that's my job. So when was the last time you had an open conversation with someone that you love about their soul? When was the last time you, you opened your Bible with someone and just read it with them and asked them what they thought of it? You pointed someone to Christ. You announced the good news to them. You invited them to assembly like this. When was the last time you did that? Jesus is with you when we do that. Maybe you're not even in the kingdom. Maybe you think that you're in the kingdom. Well, have you responded to the gospel in faith? Have you made that public confession that you really believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Savior, that he's the Son of God? And made that, that open declaration, I'm going to repent, I'm going to live for him. Have you ever done that? Maybe you've done that, but you've never really been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That's how God transfers you from darkness into light, into his kingdom. So if you've never done that, and you want to, you can be the least in the kingdom and you're greater than John the Baptist. How would you like that? Jesus will advocate for you. He will be with you forever. If you need to respond to the gospel, come forward as Drew leads us in this song.